You are listening to MSP 1337. I'm your host, Chris Johnson, and I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank our sponsor, MSP Ignite. MSP Ignite offers a peer group experience that is unique to managed service providers in the technology industry. If you are serious about implementing a model for success through sharing and collaboration of best practices, this is the best way to do it. Head on over to msp-ignite.com to get more information. All right, on to the show. Welcome everybody to this episode of MSP 1337. This week I'm joy, joined by Jay Tipton. Jay, what's, uh, I've, I'm totally drawing a blank. What's the name of your, your company? Technology specialist. Well, as any, as any company should be a specialist, right? Yep. So to help our audience out, um, they all have been following along with the, the, the series of like, what, what's kind of the next progression step or another thing that I can do to continue to improve my posture, uh, both from a cybersecurity standpoint or, or just as an MSP wanting to improve the posture. And it, it made me think about as, as we were leading up to this going, hey, I'm onboarding Jay's company into the secure outcomes program or what it's about so that as a, as a new member to MSP Ignite, you can get some, some uh, key tidbits of like why there might be some added value here. And at the same time, it reminded me of, as you and I serve on the CompTIA Security Executive Council, things that you and I have talked about, things we've shared in the past, and then looking back at the beginning of this podcast going, hey, we started out with the first episode being about an MSP that had gone through a pretty serious ransomware. So all that to say, fast forward, here we are a year later, and I'm talking to another MSP that has had, I don't want to say a similar experience. I don't, I don't think any of these experiences are really similar. They're all sort of snowflakes that have maybe some uh, similarities, but they're not really similar. Um, and so, so Jay, I, I think the first thing I wanted to talk about is this episode um, being part of the sequence is all about uh, kind of that continued progression of of, of maturity as an MSP. And I don't want to say it's just about joining a peer group, but you said this right before we started recording. Why would you join a peer group? The biggest reason for me is to get people, peer pressure is great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I've gotten lackadaisical. I get overwhelmed and I need to try to get some focus back in on focusing on the important things instead of just, you know, going off on a tangent somewhere and reading up on some particular event or some particular product for a couple hours. Right. <clears throat> this is the, well, I mean, this is the uh, trying to find the music and the noise, right? I mean, you are being bombarded by products, by service subscriptions, by the latest and greatest shiny object that solves problems you didn't know you had, whether it was featured at an ASCII show or was literally just showed up in your inbox that, you know, you should click on that link, right? That's a good link to click on if it solves a problem. You know, I, I think <clears throat> one of the challenges I think we all face is when we talk about finding the, the music through the noise or, or, or filtering out the noise is what should we be focusing on? And I think one of the challenges that you face and having gone through uh, a ransom, a ransomware event, uh, I want to get to that in a minute. Um, but, but talk to me about what, what's like that big challenge when you say you get off on a tangent or you lose focus. Cause I don't think you're speaking in a, you know, in a way that makes me think, well, Jay, you're really, really unique situation here. Uh, no other MSP is going or feeling the same pains that you are. No, it's <clears throat> to give you a little a timeline of this year. In May, I was bitten by a dog from the house behind the office. In July, we had the Kasei attack. Uh, the end of September, I was in a car accident. And just this week, I was sick for the last two weeks with something that wouldn't go away. You know, I was tested three times for COVID. I came back negative, but in well, that scenario, you get right tested there, seven times, right? I think it's, yeah, I think that's the round number. Seven, yeah. seven times. Yeah. Okay. Just to clarify for the audience. <laughs> so this year, and right now I've got two personal injury lawsuits. I've got 
the I'm still dealing with the July second attack, and I've got the enjoyable task of trying to find a car when there's nothing out there. Right. Because everybody had to have the heated steering wheel, the number of chips available for cars in general has gone through the floor. And if we could just go back to don't need to have a heated steering wheel, there'd be more cars available. I don't want a heating steering wheel. <laughs> well, I don't know if you, I don't know if you saw, but like it was recently on the news, like a lot of the car companies are dropping features in order to conserve chips for what they do have. So like, hey, here's a car that you can drive. Yeah. I heard that one of the manufacturers just trashed 20,000 new trucks because they were sitting for so long out in the field that the rats got in there and chewed up the wires. Oh, I could, I wouldn't mind having one of those trashed trucks. Cause you figure the engine, I mean, it's not made out of rubber. I mean, you got to replace some valve covers and yeah, we're good. We're, we'll we end up on a, we'll start talking about how I should have gone into the car business. Yeah, I don't think about that right now. No. So, so to clarify, I mean, besides the fact that you had the case of it, you're dealing with a lot of other things that just make running a business, especially as an SMB, just everything can be overwhelming in two seconds. This gets into, I think, one of the biggest questions that we ask ourselves is, should I take this on? Should I outsource to this? Or should I do some sort of hybrid model, right? So if I think about when I had my MSP, the one thing that I knew we couldn't do well was be a help desk because there were three of us. So like, what am I going to do? Can't get on an airplane because someone might need to print while I'm gone. Um, and we outsource help desk, right? Or we outsource knock or we outsource. And I'm not saying that to say like every MSP needs to do it the way I did it or that my way was the right way. But one of the things that you have to always constantly choose is you're picking and choosing. What are you going to do? Versus what are you going to either not do at all? It's almost like a risk game, right? What yep. am I not going to do or what am I going to outsource? So talk to me about where you're at in this journey. Cause this last year was, you know, literally a living hell for you. And I've been bit by a dog and it was a little tiny dog and, and that ended up causing me to fall. So I scraped up my hands and that was the worst part of it. My guess is you wouldn't have described this dog bite as something of significance if it wasn't larger than a chihuahua. It was two pit bulls. And I had a lab with me and the lab was fine with them coming up until they bit me. And then he just went off on them and chased them both off. But we had the police out here, animal control. Was, yeah. Great stuff. So is that where your personal injury uh, case is coming from too? That one and then the car accident. So, so let me get this straight. You have two dogs that attack you and now you're dealing with an injury suit. Wow. So I, I don't wish that on anybody. So, so fast forward, along with all of those personal things, you're also dealing with the Kaseya July event and fast forward and, and trying to get that back on track. Where, where are you at with that? How, how, is, how have you recovered, if you've recovered, from that whole event? We're in the process now of going through and fixing our shortcuts that we took. Mm -hmm. And I'll admit that we took some shortcuts that you normally don't do. But give me, give me got, an example if you're comfortable with it. Give me an example of getting the Azure reconnected to servers. Because on a couple of them, we had to break it because it was the servers were toast and we were having problems restoring. Oh, I see directory. what you're saying. You're saying shortcuts you took to get back online. Correct. Now you're going back and, and, and doing the more. Those. Got it. Not, not like. Hey, because we took shortcuts, we ended up getting ransomware. No, no, I, I, I've been a little bit overly paranoid. Uh, In cybersecurity, I don't believe there's overly paranoid. There's those that were not paranoid enough, and then there are those that are still trying to figure out what paranoid is. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, once bitten. You know, now I'm looking at ways to air gap everything. Uh, one of the issues we had was my disaster recovery plan. Yes, I do have one. It was on five machines. All five of them got encrypted at the same time. Uh, that was something I didn't foresee. Well, let's take a time out for a second. In fairness, trying to predict a worst case scenario that has a level of redundancy, because I think five is pretty redundant. 
Oh, I thought so, but you know, I'm gonna say like let's let's not let's not jump to the conclusion of like I could have just done better. This is more of like I've learned from that scenario. How do I help others learn from that one that says something about that five machine redundancy is not redundant, right? They're all on at the same time, right? Which is which is I remember you know as an MSP one of the what's the number one thing you hated the clients would do turn the computer the off. off. Yeah. Cause if they turn the machine off, you can't run updates. So you can't make it secure today. I would argue like over Thanksgiving break, I would encourage all my clients to shut their computers down. If no one's going to be in the office for three or four days, because who's going to be there to see it happen. Yep. I, we actually did shut down some. I'm not saying do all of it. I'm not, I'm not trying to say that there isn't some value in leaving on, but, but this particular scenario, like of what they were talking about in the news was like, man, turn your computers off. Yeah. So Jay, is there, you know, you joined MSP Ignite, you got set up with a meeting with me, we're, we're in that meeting, what, what is to you, what's the one thing outside of like business operation accountability, which obviously is good for anybody to get into a peer group, what can I do, what can we do as the community that is now Secure Outcomes and the audience that we've established to help you from a security standpoint? Uh, I'm here mainly to learn. You know, okay. I absorb a lot of information, uh, whether I de- agree or disagree with what they're saying. Sure. Uh, you know, the goal is to learn and to share. Right. And I've been through quite a bit and I don't, when I talk about it, I don't look at things as being spectacular that we did or anything else. My team kicked ass. It wasn't that Jay did this. It was my team did this because uh, July 4th, I called the a couple few people into a meeting. I said, I can't coordinate this. I can't sit here and direct traffic. You and you are going to do it. If it's under a thousand dollars, don't bother me. Right. So tell me, tell me, Jay, I, this just, just to help the audience. I mean, we've referred to most MSPs as being an SMB because I mean, the reality is the IT services space, unless you got more than a couple hundred employees, you're an SMB. How big, how big is, is your company as far as staffing goes? Three full-time, one part-time. So you, you've got a team. I mean, you're, you're literally the average size. I, th- I would say an average size of what is the large, the large, largely the majority of MSPs, I think, especially the ones that we talk about in the channel that are listening to this podcast are, are the smaller, less than 10, less than 15 employees. It's interesting. While you were going through your event in July, I was going through one that wasn't mine, uh, happened on June 27th, I think it was. Highly uh, sensitive situation with um, DFARS and some other fun things. I felt like I was literally living through a Tom Clancy novel. And what was interesting about their environment and kind of some of the things I've, I've gleaned about what you guys went through is that until it happens, you're invincible, right? Nothing that you, so prior to that event, there are a lot of things that, you know, we could have done better, right? Or they could have done better, right? But until you have that event, being specific about what those things are, well, maybe it'll happen. If it does happen, it'll only impact this. It won't, it won't take out five redundant backups, right? Like we, we have done a good job of creating scenarios in our, in our head that are finite, right? Like with the backups, it's like, well, if it takes out two or three, not a big deal. I got five. We don't want to have the conversation that says, well, what happens if it takes out five? So the example I'll give with this, this company, uh, this, this one was actually a first for me is crazy. The, the threat actor got onto a user's machine, a remote machine was able to scrape the password hash for local administrator. And while the user was on the VPN tunnel, tried that hash against the domain controller user administrator and got right in. That was the way that the forensics came back and said, this is how it was done. And I thought about that for a minute. I always set up Windows devices. I get rid of those default users, but do I actually clean it out? when I create a new user, when I get rid of or, or suspend, disable username administrator, do I change the credentials enough on a repeated basis to ensure that 
today's hash is not tomorrow's hash. That the user password over there is not the same as user password over here. And I, and I found that a lot of MSPs for convenience, the domain admin or the credentialed admin on machine are often the same as what's being used on the, the client environment from what was used to set it up. And they're not rotating or doing enough credential changes on a frequent enough basis to have that not be a scenario. But, but you think about it and it's like, but until the scenario happens, that wasn't necessarily a scenario that was considered. Yeah. I never thought I, I, I learned something. I and I'm not saying this is going to happen to anybody else again, right? Remember, we go through this whole risk thing. It's like probability, not very high. Impact to company, if it does happen, very high. Okay, well, I'm going to have to have that pondering conversation of like, do I make a change based on the, the level of risk that this has or not? And, and I think the, the fundamental challenge that we have, and this is where Secure Outcomes comes into play, I think is that we are a community within a peer group community that says we're here to help hold hands, sing kumbaya from that therapy session standpoint, while at the same time, not stopping it, just like we're here for you. It's like, well, what are some action items? So every week, our advisory council meets to talk about scenarios like what Jay went through. We talk about what... Um, what's happening in the media. We talk about what are the things that we can do better to provide tools and resources to the members of MSP Ignite. And in doing so, we've come up with, here are policy templates. Here are, um, we do webinars. We have uh, monthly town halls. So like tomorrow we're doing, or Thursday, we're doing a town hall on data classification. Um, one of the challenges I think we all face as MSPs is what data am I protecting? And not all data is created equally. So like to your, to your point about, you know, five redundant backups, well, what if the pertinent data just so happened wasn't on any of those five servers completely somewhere else, right? Like we think about things like 365 and file servers and all these different places that people store data. Is the important data being backed up? Is all the data being backed up? Are we treating all the data the same way? So we decided, well, why don't we have a conversation that says, while well, you may have a set of security controls, it doesn't mean that the data that's being protected has to have all of those security controls applied to everything in the environment because that's where we get cost prohibitive, right? Yeah. And you don't absolute. You yeah. And don't I have think, an absolute amount of money. Right. And, and it kind of goes back to what you said at the beginning of our, of the, the, the show is, is just talking about things like being distracted or losing focus or when you do focus, are you focusing on the right thing? And so, as this conversation has progressed to, and what's leading to this next week's town hall, which by the way, as a, a member, whether you attend the town hall or you listen to the recording afterwards, they're all available as part of your access through, through your team's drive. But one of the things that comes up is like, am I boiling the ocean? Like, am I trying to unilaterally do things all the same for all my clients across the board, putting a burden of uncertainty on everybody, including the client? Or am I strategically understanding what is my risk? What is the client's risk? And in the risk, what is the data and the responsibilities on, on infrastructure that we're responsible for? And I think when we do it from that level, we start to pace ourselves, right? Because you're not going to boil the ocean because you can't, and you don't have to do it all. And I think the paralysis analysis from a lot of MSPs that I talk to is, well, I, you know, it's just so much. And it's like, so you haven't started. Nope. Haven't started. Okay. Well, what if you did one thing? And what if that one thing was just to let all of your clients know that we're changing our security awareness program, like as in we're adding one. And the expectation is that you are going to be, we're going to put phishing campaign in place and we're going to try and fish you at least once a month. I'm not saying that's the recommended path, but I mean, like what, how hard is that to implement, especially when you consider all the free tools that are out there to do just one thing. And so as this program has progressed, which has progressed inside the, the MSP 1337 podcast is like, here is one thing that I can do. Here is now the second and the third thing that I've done. Here's the fourth thing that I'm going to execute on. Um, the other thing that, what, that I want to share with you that I think is important, especially for someone that's been through what you have is tomorrow going and writing a policy isn't going to solve your problem. And you see that a lot in vendors, products, and services is like, and we include a policy library and policy templates, and we validate your compliance and non-compliance. And we give you corrective action plans to fix those things. And it's like, 
Awesome. Do you also do that for me? Because if you can do that for me, tell me where to sign. Yep. The other challenge we face is when a vendor says that they've solved a problem for me. And the first thing I ask as an MSP is how much does it cost? Because the reality is the first question that I, that I should ask is what problem does it solve for me? If that's not the first question, the other question would be, what does this take off my plate? Because if it takes something off my plate, I don't necessarily care how much it costs because I am a finite resource and you just freed up my time. Yeah. So that's kind of in a nutshell as to what Secure Outcomes is. We meet weekly as an advisory group. We share with you guys, you have access to us through Teams channels. And I realize that for a lot of our audience who are not necessarily MSP Ignite members, maybe you're a member of a different peer group. And I commend you, like that is one of the biggest things that you can do. And if the only thing you take away from this episode is if you're not in a peer group, join one because accountability in the cybersecurity space is less about being accountable and more about being able to do things that would show accountability. So I don't know if any of this resounds for you, Jay. And I, and I, I know that there were things that you went through with the Kaseya breach that other MSPs went through too. So as we get ready to close this out, walk me through what was sort of unique about your experience of going through ransomware. And, and I get, I, I'm not saying like, Hey, can you tell me how many times you cried? That's, that's not what I'm getting. At. I, I know that this is something for those that I have talked to, there is no amount of consoling or therapy that we can put someone through to fix the PTSD that's now ensued from having that event. Yep. Uh, as I said, I, I, I could tell early on that I would not be able to coordinate everything. Uh, I couldn't make a decision on what to eat for lunch. Sure. Uh, myself and my engineer, we put in 500 hours in July. Five cases of Red Bull. Uh, Do you have that all tracked in Bright Gauge? <laughs> I've got a big spreadsheet of all, mm-hmm. all the stuff we went through. You know, I, I ordered probably almost a thousand dollars in snacks to have here, so people could Keep have working. something to eat. Uh, I had clients come in and go off our scripts and did their own machines, and then sat here and helped us do other machines to get them out of here. Uh, in about, uh, I think we had all the PCs that came into the office were getting done within two days. We had oh. clients bringing their machines in. And we had four stations set up with eight workstations each of doing nothing but going in and seeing how bad it was. If it wasn't bad, scrub it clean. If it was bad, wipe and reload. So, so just help me out here because I, this client that I helped, you know, they were all remote all over the place. I think it actually from, from actual cleanup start to finish took, I want to say it was close to 30 days to get everything completely cycled out. So if I understand you correctly, you're saying that more or less within two to five days of being crippled, you were able to get everybody. It wasn't that easy. Uh, we had some issues with our backup provider that I never took into account that we wouldn't get more than 20, 30 megs on a download. Oh, throughput. Yeah, we were having some huge, I'm not sure where the bandwidth issues were coming from, but we had servers that were taking a day to download. That, could be, then, that can still be crippling, right? And that, that was crippling us because between, it took us two days to get our password vault back up. Oh. Because all the passwords for everybody was in there. So we couldn't even start trying to recover things until that was back up. Yeah, I forget that this is like, you know, 2021. It's not like the old days where you're like, do you have that CD that has the password cracker on it that I can just pop into the machine? Yep. Uh, so lesson one was to print out all passwords and have it in a safe. Hmm. Safe is being delivered hopefully today in good shape this time. So uh, I feel like this is like one of those movies where you each put your key in and turn it and then you open up the vault and then there's the, the password sheet. So question while you're going through this do you have a plan for that so because obviously just because it's ransomware this time doesn't mean it's not a natural disaster next time what happens if the vault gets covered 
it'll be, we'll have a copy here and I'll have a copy at my house. Gotcha. So I have a what's safe the rotation? House. What's the rotation look like for something uh, like that? Right now, is this going to be monthly or if we get a new client? Got it. Uh, you, or, your, or an employee leaves. Yeah. I, I guess this doesn't change the technology being used in the event that you need to change it all at once. You can always go update the vault. Yep. Wow. Is there any other uh, big ticket items or pieces that you've had to um, implement or address along those lines? We're changing backups. We're changing antivirus or antivirus detections tools. We're changing uh, spam filtering. That's a lot. That's That's a lot of change. And I've been out of the office since July uh, with the accident. I was out for almost a month. So the whole month of October, I wasn't here. Wow. And then I had a couple of trips for asking to do presentations in between all that. So I've probably been out of the office probably two and a half, almost three months. So so one of the questions that, that I you just kind of spring on me is, Redundancy amongst applications. So I think about, um, and I'm gonna, I'm not even gonna try to grab the framework because it's, I want to say it's socks, but I could be wrong here, so don't quote me on that. Where it calls out and says you need to be redundant with vendors, right? So like if I was doing firewall redundancy, I'd have a firewall from say Fortigate and a firewall from Palo Alto, and, and I'm just throwing out names. I'm not saying that's what you should. Do. That's the products, and I also realize that in a lot of cases that adds some serious complexities. <laughs> when you're trying to do like high availability, redundancy, those kind of things. But it doesn't mean that there aren't scenarios because obviously binary questions don't necessarily have binary answers. With regards to like AV and some of those overlaps of tools, do you find yourself, you know, implementing more than just one product that's kind of in that same space in, in cybersecurity, it might even be two or three where you said, you're, you know, you're changing your AV. I mean, I think about traditional antivirus and I go, it's a necessity. Does the product that I'm adding uh, replace it? Some cases I've seen where it can. Other cases you're like, what it does really, really well is not what old school AV does. And I'm happy to have both in play. Like, are you seeing the the layering and the overlap? Are you, are you getting back to that whole trying? It's hard to make decisions again. It's on the products. No, okay. uh, we're, we're, we're changing our stack up a little bit. We're putting honey pots on servers. So if something tries to start going nuts, it starts trying to encrypt a whole bunch of files at one time, it'll get shut down. Uh, we're pushing out to all the servers. Basically, it's an allow list. If we don't sure. know what the program is, we don't know what the cert is, it doesn't run. So sort of like a trust plus model. Correct. So And we, then yeah. on the workstations, I said we're, we're changing the antivirus there. Uh, we're changing the backups to something that's more business continuity aware because we couldn't even get a CD from our backup vendor of data or our hard drive or anything. So, so that, that obviously was a change real quick. And, and obviously we're not talking about who the vendor is, but does this get into the equation of like, hey, we were happy with the cost model for this particular vendor and it made a lot of sense because I was checking a box I was able to to provide a solution that fills a gap, business continuity, you know, disaster recovery type stuff, but was at a at a cost when I needed to actually rely on it. Correct. And one of the things we couldn't foresee is having bandwidth issues that we did. Or foreseeing that you have all your clients get hit at the same time, right? Yeah, like, I mean, that wasn't in the plan. Right. Ideally, you just have one client at a time go through this, and then this is a completely different conversation. Yeah. So this, this, is, this is the one thing that I have learned in all of this is that if you are an MSP, all of your clients are just another, another room in your office. There is no them versus me. It's all we because... And any one of those being a weak link is all of you being a weak link, right? Because no matter how much segregation we do, you, you basically, you lived through it. You could have easily been not the weakest link, whether you were or weren't. Any one of your clients could have been the doorway that basically ended up with where you were at. And that's one that we can't predict. Yep. 
Yeah, I wouldn't have never guessed what it came through like it did. So any, any advice to listeners, obviously we can talk about products and services all day long. I think you've done a really good job of highlighting some things that I think any MSP that's looking, I don't even want to get into security with the language, just say, hey, have you really gone through and evaluated and tested your entire stack of products and services to make sure that you have the bandwidth and the resources in the event that something not so exciting on the on the fun like I got on a roller coaster because I wanted to as opposed to I got hit by the front car of a roller coaster um, that you would you would share like some we don't want anybody else to go through this right Jay no God no uh, the biggest thing is looking at more air gaps mm-hmm. uh, I'm in the process or my ex-business partner who actually came down for that whole month of July to, and was here helping us get recover things. Uh, we're setting up a SQL server that'll have no out, outside access whatsoever. Well, It'll have access to a couple of machines, a couple of ports and everything else is locked down and there's no remote access into it. So Jay, I will tell you this. One of the benefits of being part of secure outcomes is obviously we won't do this on a recorded call, but, I would recommend that find some time maybe before the holidays where I can sit down with you and I'll walk through your stack and let's talk about the gaps and areas where because of the participation in secure outcomes, there are a lot of products and services that I had never even heard of. And I'm like, oh yeah, I've been using that for like five years. And you're like, um, who are they? Where did they come from? And what do you mean it's free? <laughs> Uh, I mean, I'll tell you, I used a product the other day and it's not one you've probably heard of. So I'm not even going to say the vendor's name. It literally does an AD password credential audit. It identifies who the, uh, who has domain admin credentials. It identifies uh, 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 same password. So like if you have not unique password, whereas it says, it says, Hey, in your AD environment, we found 50 users that are all same password. Uh, and we're still trying to figure out how it's determining that. Like, is it decrypting the password? I don't think so. I think it's looking at the hash and going, hey, the hashes are exactly the same. Yeah, I'd say they're comparing hashes. And then the other piece it did is it said, it, it's kind of, I mean, you've seen tools like this, Network Detective and others, but it, uh, it did all this in a dashboard. It gave me the ability and I freaked out over Thanksgiving break as I was going through this environmental audit. And I killed all kinds of user profiles that should have been gone years ago, but they were buried in OUs that I hadn't seen. Um, Just little things like that, that a lot of us are like, where is this? Where did you get this tool? How do I get my hands on this tool? Because all of a sudden it's the little things that we can suddenly have a huge impact with that transform our ability to secure the environment. Yeah. That's why I'm in groups because I can't look at everything. Absolutely. I don't have that much time. You don't. Time is finite and so are we. So Jay, um, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to you today. Uh, For those of you listening, this is MSP 1337. Have a great week.